Yes, indeed. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute, and I'm here with my very good friend, longtime friend, almost, almost don't want to talk about how long it's been, Mike, <laughs> but Michael Man, Sullivan. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we got to know each other a long, long time ago. And so anyway, uh, we are going to examine this evening uh, it's this evening where at the, when we're filming this, it'll be aired on YouTube, what have you, and as well as my Facebook page and Mike's as well, I'm assuming, right? So uh, we want to address a recent video by, by Doug Wilson. It's on YouTube. You can find it there. It is entitled Theological Jenga and Full Preterism. Now, it was produced back in March. And this is, his video was sort of kind of an outgrowth of a letter that he signed along with, I don't even know how many signatories there are now. Do you, Mike? It just keeps growing, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, anyway, it was an open letter condemning Gary DeMar because Gary DeMar refuses to point the finger of heresy at the full preterist. And anyone who has followed Gary DeMar's ministry knows that there are just tons and tons and tons of people who have become full preterist because they followed the logic of his hermeneutic. And by the way, the same can be said of Kenneth Gentry, who, <laughs> who jumps up and down and screams and hollers and denies that. But I, I tell you, I have corresponded with, I would, I would safely say hundreds of people who have said they're now full preterists by following Kenneth Gentry's hermeneutic. Yeah. So anyway, and even even yeah, Doug ahead. Wilson's even Doug Wilson's writings can lead someone to full preterism, as as we will look at here briefly. But um, yeah, I mean, they're not just mad at Gary because he's going to a full preterist conference and he's not willing to condemn us as damnable heretics. They're really angry at him because. He will not answer these three questions that Sam, Jason, and, and Kenneth Gentry have posed to him uh, concerning a future coming of Jesus and a end of world history and a physical bodily resurrection at the end of world history. Correct. He has to affirm these three things or they're going to disfellowship him, not support his ministry, you know, um, and... And I think because in his writings, he's just honest and he's been honest. You know, he's just said, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, some of these time checks are are connected to the resurrection mm -hmm. and we have to deal with these. What about all the parallels between the Olivet Discourse and First Thessalonians 4? I'm, I'm reexamining that. I, I don't understand why we can't work it the opposite way. Why can we accept Beale and the amillennialist that says all these are valid and they're the same event? Paul's eschatology is Jesus' eschatology, but we can't do it in reverse. If I say Matthew 24 was fulfilled in AD 70, why can't we go back to 1 Thessalonians 4 and say it's the same event? And it makes no sense. Gary knows that. Uh, Gary knows, you know, what's going on in Daniel 12, which is probably one of the first things we're going to cover here. Wow. Um, and he knows that Doug just won't answer. And he obviously didn't answer, as we'll get into here in a minute, the, the big issue of Daniel 12. But <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's an understatement. Yes. Well, what I what I found so amusing uh, and bothersome in, in Doug Wilson's 10 points was so many of his comments, so many of his positions were entirely presuppositional. Oh, yeah. I mean, he is taking it for granted. And, and we need to talk about Chesterton, Chesterton's fence because that was his point number one in his mm -hmm. 10 reasons for rejecting full preterism. Uh, and make no mistake, I, I think Chesterton's fence has a lot of good thought behind it. Um, when Chesterton introduced his philosophical argument, or uh, I don't know that it was an argument per se, but it was a philosophical principle of argumentation. 
uh, it really had a profound impact on, on the world of philosophy, the world of thought. And again, I think I think it's good. But GK, I mean, excuse me, Doug Wilson takes it for granted that the fence, here's the issue, that the fence that historical Christianity has built in the middle of the road, <laughs> to use the illustration, is a valid fence. Now, here, right. uh, so let's just kind of get into it. Uh, Doug Wilson appeals to, again, G.K. Chesterton's fence. So a very quick explanation of G.K. Chesterton's fence. Simply stated, G.K. Chesterton said, it, imagine yourself and you're walking along and you find a fence in the middle of a road. You don't know why that fence was there. So you go, I don't know why that fence is there, so I'm going to tear it down. I don't see the purpose of it. So you tear it down. Now, that fence may or may not have a reason for being there. And if you tear it down without doing what Chesterton calls second-level thinking, second-level logic, then it may be that you will find out, sadly, that, you know what, that fence had a pretty good purpose after all, later down the road. So you have to be careful of just willy-nilly tearing down long-standing fences. Well, again, I, I think there's a lot of validity that. But, of course, he's throwing that as an aspersion toward us, toward pred predators. He says, well, predators are just tearing down the fence of historical uh, eschatology. They're not even thinking about the consequences, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, a whole lot of us have given an awful lot of thought to this. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, I would just jump in there and say, well, how much of the fence is left after partial preterism comes <laughs> in and takes out Matthew 24, 30, you know, pretty much uh, 19 chapters or, well, 21 chapters of the book of revelation i mean not much of the fence is left of, of of your creedal presuppositional westminster confession of faith um <laughs> so it was I, a picket I, fence and now they go along removing all of these slats <laughs> yeah yeah it was a 50 foot fence and now it's maybe like 10 and it's just yeah. kind of got holes in it everywhere i'm going to pick up on what you just said you know, not only do they eliminate the Olivet Discourse, which, of course, is the foundation for Pauline eschatology, but they also take out all of these slats of Chesterton's fence that, that say, well, the coming of the Lord is at hand. The end of all things has drawn near. These things must surely come to me. The, the majority of these reformers, the majority of these signers of this letter of condemnation of Gary DeMar, acknowledge these time statements. We know Kenneth Gentry does. And has for years, decades. And so you got this fence and the partial preterists, as you have so aptly stated, they've reduced this fence down to just a little bitty tiny thing. Don, we can drive a truck through their fence. <laughs> and you and I often do. <laughs> let, let us say that. <laughs> right. So let's take a look. And, and Chesterton well understood what he was saying. He was a brilliant thinker. Um, what Wilson is assuming is that that eschatology established by, specifically, the Reformers is a good, solid, stout steel wall or steel fence. And yet here's the ironic thing. You alluded to it a moment ago. In the Westminster Confession of Faith, and I find it so interesting that Kenneth Gentry is one of the signers of this letter against Kenneth Gentry. But Kenneth Gentry, in his book, The Beast of Revelation, categorically rejects the Westminster Confession statement of eschatology on the man of sin, on the beast, Mark of the Beast, etc. Babylon is Rome the Roman Catholic Church, the beast is that pope. The man of sin is that ungodly pope. Kenneth Gentry, who tells us on the one hand, 
well, preterists are heretics because they reject the creeds. They violate the creeds. Yet in that book, The Beast of Revelation, what does Kenneth Gentry do? Well, you have to understand. You have to understand that the Westminster Confession of Faith was written during a period of intense controversy with the church at Rome. And the Westminster Confession of Faith, and let's express it like this, the eschatological fence established and built by the Westminster Confession of Faith was built at a time of controversy between the Reformers and Rome. And Kenneth Gentry states, the Reform position was not based upon careful exegesis, but upon the controversy of the time. So what does that tell us, Mike, about that fence? Yeah, and even Gary, had, when he's addressing this issue in his podcast, he says there's not, there's barely any scripture references to the creeds. I mean, there's just not a whole lot there, uh, or at least there's no exegesis right. of the past, the few passages that are there to uphold some of the statements. And that's where Gary's just scratching his head, like, well, show me your work. I need to see the exegesis. And how far do we go with the time texts and and the parallel passages? Because you know, and, and I know that they love to make all these parallels between the Olivet Discourse Everywhere else, Second Peter else. three or the Book of Revelation, selective places in Thess First and Second Thessalonians, but their hermeneutic is just so inconsistent. And I don't want to jump ahead of me, but I just I couldn't help it when Wilson was saying, "Oh, well, there's just fourteen of them out there, and I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to deal with it." But we'll, we'll we'll get to that later. We'll get but. to that. Yes, <laughs> without any doubt whatsoever. And you're. Your response to him on the email that you sent him was was spot on, I might add. And, and like I say, we'll get to that. So here's the point, ladies and gentlemen. Doug Wilson is saying that there is an eschatological fence that has been erected by, in, in, in his appeal, it would be the Reformed tradition. And yet, now I'll, I'll be really honest at this point, Mike, I don't know, perhaps you do, does Doug Wilson accept the Westminster Confession of Faith of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy being the man of sin in Babylon? I don't yeah. remember reading anything from him on that. No, he doesn't. And he's also federal vision, which is, a, I think, I believe, a different view of justification than forensic justification within the Reformed community. And many of the Reformers have totally said that's, you know, that's a damnable heresy and blah, 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 blah. And yet, you know, Gary never threw stones at, at Doug. And and um, so it's just it's very ironic. I mean, we even mentioned that in House Divided, how uh, Doug is very selective on his creedal orthodoxy. But well, it's not only Wilson, but let's face it, uh, many of the other signers of that inquisition letter i i think that's really about the best description that you can put on that letter uh you know we the undersigned you know and all this kind of stuff like that uh calling gary into question for his lack of orthodoxy and it just smacks of an inquisitorial uh spirit as far as i am concerned so the point that i'm making here is doug wilson is saying okay we have this eschatological fence we don't dare tear that thing down. You've got to have second level thinking before you attack it. Well, wait a minute, Doug Wilson. You already reject a bunch of slats of this fence. You don't accept the creedal, i.e., the Westminster Confession faith. You don't accept the creedal position on eschatology concerning the man of sin. Now, do you say, yes, there's still a future coming physical resurrection? Yes, that's not the point. The point of it is, and we could even make this argument. I, I think it's a very valid point. If, if you strip that fence of Thessalonians, and I'm talking 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you strip Thessalonians of a future application, you have stripped it of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Absolutely. And, I mean, there you, you cannot divide them, even though men, but to go back to Kenneth Gentry, Kenneth Gentry says, well, you see, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that was fulfilled in AD 70. And we know that because it uses the word parousia and because 
of the other elements, the time indicators that are there in the text. Oh, but wait, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 uses a different word for coming, uses a form of erkomai, elfi, and that's talking about the end of time. So here's Kenneth Gentry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, end of time, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, A.D. 70. And it's that's the application because 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 uses Elthi and Apocalypsis, while 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 uses Parousia. Well, it evidently seemed to escape Kenneth Gentry. And remember, folks, this is one of the signers of this Inquisition letter. Seems to have escaped Kenneth Gentry's notice, or attention, rather, that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 to 17, Paul uses the word parousia in a text that Kenneth Gentry says, oh, that's the end of the world. Now, where does Doug Wilson stand on this? I mean, he's likewise inconsistent in his application of some of these Thessalonian passages. So oh, yeah. here, we, here we got Gentry. Oh, parousia in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's the end of the world. Oh, wait. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Parousia, that's A.D. 70. <laughs> and we're supposed yeah. to see this as this rock-solid steel fence that's been erected that we don't dare tear down. Yeah, and it's interesting because he's backtracked on Matthew 24, 27, where Parousia is used with, with Christ coming as a lightning, but I, I see that as more the sunshine shining from the east to the west. But um, so I was trying to figure out, well, what is your strategy to, to, I mean, I understood his strategy to backtrack on mellow. That was clear enough, but backtracking on Matthew 24, 27, you know, I guess almost like a RT France thing. I, it just didn't make any sense because he's, he's going to other texts where Paris are, is used and saying that was AD 70. So <laughs> I don't know. Well, there uh, in my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings, I have an entire section illustrating Kenneth Gentry's uh, incredible flip-flopping and inconsistencies. And remember, folks, Doug Wilson and Kenneth Gentry are both on the si same side condemning Gary DeMar. All that Gary DeMar is doing, as Michael has already pointed out, all that Gary is saying, look, folks, there's there's some issues here that the church is not dealing with. There's some real problems that if we're going to be honest students of the word, and isn't it, isn't it amazing that he's being con condemned for saying, let's open the book. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So anyway, all that's all the world Gary is doing. He's acknowledging issues that scholars and many of the signers of this inquisition letter acknowledge your problems in their own writings or in their own lectures. But when Gary does it so formally, so publicly, and even in lectures, spo lectureship sponsored by full preterists for crying out loud, mm. oh my goodness gracious, let, let's let erect the pole and gather the firewood. Yeah. That's Th a things have got to be done. <laughs> it was funny how Doug wanted him to, uh, to sign a letter and just say, just, you know, Gary, just say that you believe these three creedal things. And you can even admit that even though you, you don't see any strong exegetical support for them, <laughs> you know, um, that that'll be good enough. It's like, what? I mean, yeah. I, you know, can you, can you imagine someone telling Luther to do that? <laughs> it's like, here I stand, you know, my conscience, I cannot go anywhere else. And it's just like, how how could a good godly friend, you know, give you counsel like that? I just, anyway, well, we better get going, man, if, if we're going to do this to an hour. Uh, well, we're not going to cover all these points. Let's face it. We're going to have to yeah. do another program for sure. So the point I wanted to make here, ladies and gentlemen, is that while Chesterton's fence philosophy is valid, that is, we, we need to be cautious and not just willy-nilly, capriciously, arbitrarily tear down things for the purpose of tearing them down or simply because we don't understand. But Chesterton, the fallacy of Chesterton, and he actually recognized that there could be some fallacies in his own argument. He, he laid out some 
shall we say, shall we say some caveats? Doug Wilson didn't honor any of Chesterton's own caveats. And that is, you know what? There may be some problems with the fence. <laughs> right. And the reason Mike and I have taken the time to point out some of the fallacies, uh, and I'll even use the word, I don't, I don't mean to be ugly here, but the duplicity of some of the signers of the letter is, is they're over here, then they're over here. This guy contradicts this guy. In other mm. words, at different, <clears throat> among yes. these different men, they are all, in one way or another, taking planks out of this fence. And yet Ch uh, Wilson is saying, no, 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 we don't tear the fence down. Yet he is one of the men that's taking planks out of this fence. Right. So that letter that they initially wrote to to uh, Gary had no scripture references. Right. And they followed it up with, uh, you know, hyperpreterism.com or something, some other thing that did have some scriptures. And as you, as you know, I produced a chart and I said, okay, so of the somewhat 20 passages that are cited, when I look at all of the signers of that, and at that point there was like 30 something, I said, they, all of them can only agree on three passages. <laughs> And they were Philippians 3, which we'll get to at some point, um, and John 5 and John 6, the last day. Yep. And if and if I remember, it was just those three. And I was like, wow, that's 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 a real weak fence. Yeah. You got you got three, you know, little things here. <laughs> that, but, that's it. By the way, folks, let me urge you, if you did not see Mike's chart that he posted on his Facebook page. Mike, I would suggest you post that again uh, and give everybody the reference because, folks, this was this was incredibly good. I mean, it was it was truly awesome because, as he just said, he he, he just exposed them. That's all in the world you can say. Okay, here are twenty signers. Yet look at all of the verses that these same men apply to AD seventy. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's the full preterist application of those verses. And it boils yeah. down to three verses that they all agree on. And this, this is supposed to be the fence. Chesterton's fence that Doug Wilson says, we just, oh, we just better not tear it down. Well, only if, only if, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the whole point of Gary DeMar, only if and when that fence can be demonstrated to be solid and sure and strong. Not through creeds, not through <clears throat> ad hominem and attacks, not by tradition. As Gary has said, show me your work. Show me your exegesis. Don't throw stones. Lots of that going on. Show me your work. And for challenging, <clears throat> for asking for exegesis, he got attacked. Yeah. And and when you look at those, just those three passages out of the 20 that they listed that they can only really agree on, I I can take those away too. Oh, sure. Um, Philippians 3. All right. There's an already not yet resurrection going on there. But look at what brings that resurrection about in the next chapter. Yep. The day of the Lord is at hand or it's near. Now, your classic all millennials is going to say, well, that's the second coming that brings about the resurrection of Philippians 3. Well, all these signers are divided on it. Yep. All the partial predator says, well, that coming was AD 70. <laughs> and the other ones are saying it's the second coming. So there goes that. Then you got uh, John 5. Well, that's the resurrection of Daniel 12. Some of them say Daniel 12 was fulfilled in AD 70. So there goes that. And then your last one is John 6, the last day. Well, Doug Wilson has told us that the last days is between AD 30 to AD 70 that closes out the old covenant age. And you have all the other ones saying, well, the last day is the last day of the last days. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, please I don't act like these guys are as united as they portray themselves right. as, because like Don is saying their fence, there's just really not a whole lot there. That's exactly right. So while caution is wise thing before tearing down fences, what partial preterists do is they destroy most of the fence. Full preterists 
base our case on the logic and on the exegesis of partial preterists. We're just consistent with it. And, and what we do is we show that the fence was erected upon false premises. And let me allude to John 6, 39, the last day. This is one of Sam Frost's favorite, favorite voices or uh, passages of the appeal. Well, the last day has got to be the last day. Well, okay, that's fine. I, I even accept that. But where does that come from? Daniel, it comes from Daniel chapter 12, 1290 days and the last day, 1335 days. Daniel would arise at the end of the days. Hello, would that be the last day? Daniel would arrive, arise on the last day. The last day is the day of the resurrection, but the resurrection would be fulfilled when the power of the holy peoples uh, would be completely shattered. Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. There goes John chapter 6. So the yeah. three verses that they say, oh, oh boy, we're united here now. Uh, no, they, they belong in the full preterist paradigm. Now, speaking of Daniel 12, Mike, <laughs> yeah. go over with us what Doug Wilson has to say about. about oh. Wow, I, I I couldn't believe this because Doug knows how important Daniel twelve is. Yes, and um, so he didn't even attempt to open up Daniel twelve. He wasn't going to read it to you. He wasn't going to give you the context. He wasn't even going to admit that his own partial preterist colleagues such as Kenneth Gentry who also signed this letter uh, attacking Gary DeMar believes that the resurrection of Daniel 12 2 and 3 is con in inseparably connected to the tribulation of verse 1 all right and therefore the end the hour of the end and that all of this is connected to verse 7 all of these things are going to take place together during a three and a half years period of time when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. He didn't even want to give the argument that his own partial preterists give to say that was fulfilled in 8070, let alone ours. And so he pretended as if this is a more difficult passage. And because it's so difficult, we need to go to the New Testament to see how the New Testament deals with it. But... Uh, the problem there, obviously, Don, is that Daniel 12 is extremely clear, and that's why the guy couldn't even read it. I agree 100%. I, I, I'm, I know I was like you. You know, he, he starts out and he says one of the very first principles of, her, of hermeneutic is that you allow the clear passages to explain the obscure. You know, well, okay, sure. Nobody's going to argue with that. And he said, for instance, this is one of the reasons why <clears throat> Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 is so obscure. And that's why I hesitate to even appeal to it. And I'm going, say what? Listen, even, even skeptical scholars such as John Collins in his commentary on Daniel said, Daniel chapter 12 is the clearest passage on resurrection to be found in the entirety of the Tanakh. Hello, he's a skeptic. <laughs> he doesn't believe in inspiration. He certainly doesn't believe that Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 was predicting an end of time, or if it did, it certainly failed. But he says it's the clearest Old Testament prophecy. And then you have men such as Brent Petrie, Catholic scholar, in his book, Jesus, Tribulation, and the, and the End of Exile, <clears throat> I've mentioned this book many, many times, and folks, if you haven't read Petri's book, I strongly, strongly recommend it. Uh, obviously, there's some things in there that I'm not going to agree with that Mike wouldn't agree with, but that, as an overall thesis, and it was his doctoral thesis, uh, personally, I would have given him three doctorates for that book. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is absolutely outstanding. Brent Petrie, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, is the clearest Old Testament prophecy of the resurrection to be found in the entire Old Testament. Now, by the way, Brent Petrie is not one of these higher critics that rejects the inspiration of Scripture. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, it's so fascinating to me, and it was thrilling the very first time I read it. He comes to Daniel chapter 9. 
in its prediction of the resurrection, you know, the new creation, everlasting righteousness, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, he, huh, he takes note of the higher critical argument that Daniel 9 was predicting the period of Antiochus Epiphanes. And he said, that's very clearly false because Daniel 9, verse 26, or verse 25, I'm sorry, verse 26, says, the city and the sanctuary shall be destroyed. And he said, this is the Achilles heel of the higher critical view because the city and the sanctuary were clearly not destroyed at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. So he's got this very conservative side and when he comes to Daniel 9 and Daniel chapter 12, to reiterate, he sees Daniel chapter 12 as the clearest statement and prediction of the resurrection to be found anywhere. And guess what? It underlies John 5. <laughs> it underlies John 6. Another scholar by the name of uh, <clears throat> Mahalios, I've, his first name just left me a moment ago. And so uh, the Daniel, the eschatological Danielic hour in the book of John. Well, guess what? He's a higher critical guy. He likewise says, Daniel chapter 12 is the clearest prediction of the resurrection to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. Oh, and by the way, he says that Daniel 12 lies directly behind and serves as a source for John chapter 5. 20, 25 through 29. Absolutely. The the old Greek, actually, G.K. Beale did a great job oh, on that. Yeah. It shows how the old Greek Septuagint is says that it's the hour of the end. And then right. he goes right to John 4 and John 5, and he says, Jesus is developing the already and not yet of the coming hour, the the all uh, the not yet, but the hour is right now yeah he already and he he shows that and as i've pointed out before gentry takes john four the coming hour um and that was then was between 80 30 to 80 70 but when we get into john chapter five the same language and i think one of your friends uh pointed out that it's a kayak a chiasm actually yes yeah. so even it connects the two chapters even stronger together so. And and we should point out at this time, <clears throat> pardon me, that Kenneth Gentry once took Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 as an end of time resurrection. Yep. In his book, The Greatness of the Great Commission, yep. he was very clear on it. Undeniable reference to the end of time resurrection, bodies out of the graves, etc. However, in his later books, and after several exchanges back and forth with people like, oh, I don't know, Mike Sullivan, Don Preston, <laughs> and others on Daniel chapter 12, in which he was just absolutely taken to the woodshed, <clears throat> all of a sudden, Kenneth Gentry now, by the way, violates the creeds, the ones that mention Daniel chapter 12, there are some of them. But he violates the creeds and he says, well, you know, and by the way, he doesn't say I once took Daniel 12, 2 as a prediction right. to the end of the world. He, he doesn't tell you what he used to believe. No, 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 no. He just simply says, this is probably better understood to speak of a spiritual resurrection of, of Israel that took place in the body of Christ in AD 70. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> I wonder, Mike, how many of the signers of that letter would agree with Gentry on that. That yeah. would be an interesting survey study to do. Absolutely. If, yeah. And we already know what Doug Wilson says. Well, it's just too obscure. Yeah, he won't even touch it. He, he, he wouldn't even discuss it. Now, again, I want to cut him some slack here <laughs> a little bit. <clears throat> not a lot. His purpose was not to exegete each one of these points. I understand that. He was just trying to give, okay, folks, here are 10 reasons for rejecting, uh, you know, the full printer's view because it's theological Jenga. Well, it seems to me, if you were going to spend 30 minutes condemning another view, at least you should give 
some kind of probative evidence, some kind of evidence that proves your point, at least in a way that people could go and examine it. <clears throat> I suspect, Mike, may be wrong, but I sort of kind of suspect that there are a lot of people out there that were fam that are familiar with Daniel chapter 12. And when they heard oh, yeah. Doug Wilson say, oh, it's so obscure as to, you know, we can't even discuss it. I yeah, suspect there are no red flags. Went up <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, what? Obscure? Right. And they probably. Dude, you've got to deal with this. These full predators, that's all they're talking about. They yeah. want to deal with this and, and how the New Testament develops it. And you're just taking a pass on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I suspect, and it makes you wonder how many of the other signers of that letter were listening to his presentation and who did the very thing that you're saying. Wait a minute, Doug. <laughs> These full predators are beating us over the head with Daniel chapter 12. They're, they're embarrassing us on this. You got to help us out here. And instead, it's like, well, no, 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 no. Uh, it's just too obscure. I'm not going to deal with it. Uh, it's kind of like my opponent in that formal debate last night that I had with Mark Smith, a former Christian turned atheist, um, when I quoted the Old Testament passages in which Yahweh had come out of heaven on the clouds with the angels in flaming fire, he was seen, he was heard, but never literally, visibly, body, bodily. My opponent, Mark Smith, said, I am not going to talk about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is totally irrelevant to the discussion of eschatology. And, you know, you try to have a poker face in a debate, right? <laughs> I nearly fell out of my chair. <laughs> and it was kind of funny. My wife and I were talking about that very thing. She, she said she was watching it. And she said, I'm going, oh, my God goodness he just walked into don's fortress <laughs> yeah I, I when i saw that i was like oh here comes the train <laughs> here it comes, dude. Here it comes. <laughs> you you blew it big time oh to say i just you can't use the old test and here's i would add to this to that debate not only do we want to look at the um apocalyptic language in the old testament to help us with the new testament but the time text too I mean, you got all kinds of imminent time texts, especially in Ezekiel, oh. that are always taken literally within, you know, one, five years, 30 or 40 years of the prophet and his contemporary audience. And so now we come to the New Testament and the New Testament authors are following the same principle on the timing issue and the apocalyptic language. So to say that we can't use the Old Testament to help us understand what Paul is talking about in First Thessalonians 4 or Peter in Second uh, Peter 3 is just ridiculous. That was... Well, and I mean, the point you're making is absolutely valid. The reason I didn't do that very thing is because Mark Smith acknowledges all of the time statements. He but just the says they... Test, yeah, but in the Old <clears> Testament, <throat> I would say, Mark, you, you recognize this time statement in yeah. the Old Testament is connected to the apocalyptic language, and it was fulfilled in a non-physical way, correct? Correct. And if he says yes, then, well, here we go in the New Testament. Right. Why aren't you implementing that same hermeneutic? But he, he didn't want to go there. He was not going to go there. No. <laughs> he said that three or four times. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to discuss the Old Testament. Yeah. Well, okay, that's fine. Paul did. <laughs> New Testament writers did. Why won't you? So anyway, all of that said, so Doug followed up his statement that Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 is too obscure uh, to him, uh, it's it's not it shouldn't even be brought up in in the discussion, and he followed that up <clears throat> that he he believes that we ought to follow number one the eschatology of Martha, number two the Jewish concept of resurrection, meaning the Pharisaic doctrine of the resurrection. The only and, uh, did you catch the Orthodox? He said. The Orthodox Jews of that time. I did. <laughs> I did. You know, he didn't want to tell you that the that the Jews had all kinds of views on resurrection, a spiritual resurrection at death, and a spiritual resurrection from Hades into God's presence at the end of their age. 
Correct. Which is our position and which is some of the partial predators position. Correct. He did, he will not tell the people give an honest representation of what is taking place here. And for me, that's, that's, that's hard to swallow. Well, I, I agree. It is somewhat hard to swallow. You know, when you say that the Jewish concept of resurrection was invariably physical bodies coming out of the grave, I'm going, okay, let's just, let's call time out right here. That is not a scholarly, that is not a historical position. One scholar by the name of Karagunas, uh, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly or not, and but if anyone wants the citation, uh, there, the PDF is available on Academia. Uh, dot edu <clears throat> Karagunas documents something like six six different views of the resurrection that were held by differing elements within Judaism so again you notice as Mike well pointed out there uh, Doug was careful to say among the orthodox Jews well guess what a lot of these other alternate views they were not considered heretics. Hmm. They were just part of the matrix of Jewish belief concerning the resurrection. And so, like I said, Karagunas documents at least six different hmm. views. And he's not the only one, by the way. I have I have a notation of several other scholars who document from rabbinic writings the different views of resurrection. And what you pointed out there is absolutely very valid. One of those views was a resurrection from Hades directly to heaven. No bodies, no physical bodies. And by the way, <clears throat> you can document that in some of the intertestamental writings as well. So here we go where Doug Wilson is trying to give the impression Mm -hmm. Boy, there was this absolutely uniform view of resurrection among the Jews of the first century. Look how out of step these full preterists really are. Right. <laughs> I was in a discussion on Facebook not long ago, Mike. I don't remember if you monitored any of it. I know you didn't chime in and write anything. Uh, but William Vincent, that you know there, uh, you know, is one of the guys on Facebook. He came across, he said, well, Pharisees believed in physical resurrection. Paul said, I'm a Pharisee. Therefore, Paul believed in physical resurrection. And look, I heard that argument so much when I very first started struggling with my views and I, uh, before I had studied very much on that particular aspect. I thought, that sounds pretty good. Good syllogism. Pharisees believed in physical resurrection. We know that Josephus said the Pharisees believe in resurrection. They believe in spirits. They believe life after death. Oh, boy, you look here. Look what the Pharisees believed. I had such an inadequate view of what the Pharisees actually believed at that point. But at least I thought, okay, that's a valid point. Paul said, I'm a Pharisee. Therefore, well, you know, at least theoretically, Mike, the more we study the more some of these objections, we start going, did I really think that was good? <laughs> Honestly, I thought that was good. Yeah. So, so did Paul believe that all these bodies were going to tunnel underneath <laughs> the, the ground until they popped up in Israel and were raised from their let's, let's bone? <laughs> I Folks, mean, what what Mike is referring to here is, a well-attested doctrine among some of the rabbis, not all of them, but some of the rabbis in ancient Israel. They held this belief. If if you were a good, faithful Jew, which to them in that in the context of the writing was, if you're just a child of Abraham, <laughs> if, you're, if you're of the bloodline of Abraham and you're in Rome, let's say, and you die on the day of resurrection, your bones and your body is going to start rolling in the underground passages unseen, of course, and it's going to roll all the way back to Jerusalem and Judea, at least Judea, if not Jerusalem. Then it's going to pop out of the grave. Although that's not where your, where your grave was. <laughs> your grave's back in Rome. So how are you going to come out of your grave? <laughs> right, that's a good point. Yeah, so that's what Mike was alluding to. That was one of the ancient Jewish views of resurrection. So the next question would be, Doug Wilson, do you ascribe to that Jewish belief of resurrection? 
that belief I've never read, Mike, and this may be simply a point of ignorance on my part, okay? I have never read any Jewish condemnation of that view. It's just a view that, that was out there. It was one of many that was out there. So I haven't found where it was condemned. So one might very well argue, one might very well state, you know, this was part of the orthodox view. So does what does Doug Wilson accept that? Yeah. How do we exactly know, you know, what what the orthodox view was or what what like you said, what was the matrix of it? And um, you know, my old testament sources that I quote on that say that we have no evidence what was the more predominant view. That's right. Uh, we we have no evidence that the physical view was was more popular than the spiritual. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but, but there's a very good Old Testament scholar that I quote that just says that. So, and you know that's I, I don't want to segue into that because he, he he brought up the 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 resurrection of the second Maccabees and he tied it into the better resurrection of Hebrews eleven. So we'll, we'll get to that being raised in the land uh, here in a second and the better resurrection. But let's make just a couple points on um, the resurrection of John 11. Um, he starts, Jesus starts out by saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Don, Jesus uses his I am statement seven times in John. Can you think of one of them where he is, he is, is it's a physical fulfillment? No, just like there is no, <clears throat> well, just like in John, there are seven signs which Jesus performed. Not one of those signs pointed to a literal physical duplication of that sign. I see he where talk, you're going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like Jesus talked about shall never die in, in the book of John. Not mm -hmm. one time is he talking about shall never die physically. Over and over and over in the, in the Gospel of John, the entire focus is on the non-literal, non-physical. And yet, this is where our Reformed friends, our Futurist friends of all stripes, oh, this, oh, Jesus, I have the resurrection and life. In other words, Jesus is saying dead bodies are going to come out of the grave one day. Yes. So he says, I am the bread, I am the water of life, I am the light of the world, I'm the door, I'm the good shepherd, I am the true vine, I am the way. All of these are spiritual when he says, I am fill in the blank. But now, according to Doug Wilson, because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, because Jesus was raised physically, somehow this, we got to take this one as the exception to the rule of the gospel of John. And uh, I don't think that's very good. All references to life in the Gospel of John up to this point um, are all spiritual. Chapter 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and 10. Um, so if you're going to make life, you know, being raised physically um, at the end of world history or, or some kind of rapture or, or translation of the living, uh, that's not going to work. Um, and as you pointed out in John... Every time he does a miracle, it's a physical sign of something spiritual. That's right. Uh, so that you might know that the Son of Man has the power and authority to forgive sins. Pick up your mat and walk. All right. I'm going to do this, but the greater miracle is to forgive sin, which is something internal. So I, I, he has no grounds here in in John and John 11. I don't know. Uh, I didn't really see any good exegetical argument. I didn't um, hear he one. Just assumed, like, he just assumed what Martha believed. Yes. And went to, and went to John 6, and that was it. That was his whole. I, I do want to go back to his appeal to the Pharisees believed in resurrection. I mentioned William Vincent on Facebook and the argument that he made. Well, the Pharisees believed in physical resurrection. Paul said, I'm a Pharisee. Therefore, Paul must have believed in that. Well, here's what I pointed out. The Pharisees, and by the way, I, I wrote this book right here, Paul on Trial. Uh, it is Paul, the Pharisees, and the resurrection. Let's think about the Pharisees for just a moment. Let us grant, for argument's sake, I don't have a, I don't have a major problem with it at all. <clears throat> I state so in the book. Let us assume and agree that the Pharisees did believe in physical resurrection. Okay. 
what William Vincent and what Doug Wilson is not asking about, they're not inquiring about this, they don't want to even talk about this, is that the Pharisees' view of the resurrection was absolutely inextricably, inseparably bound up with their view of the restoration to the land. See, that goes back to the Pharisaic view of the dead body in Rome rolling all the way <laughs> back, to, back to Judea to be raised out of the graves. Or, real, real quick, or the view, which I will address in my lecture on 1 Corinthians 15 in a couple of weeks, or the view that said, if you died and were buried outside the land, no resurrection for you. That's right. Poor Moses. <laughs> Poor Moses. <laughs> um, <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> but these guys would travel the Roman Empire because Jesus said, you travel land and sea to make, you know, twice the sons of hell that you are. And they would go around and they would tell these people in Corinth or Colossia or, or Thessalonica, hey, if you're not converted to Judaism and, and come and be a proselyte in the land, no eternal life, no, no resurrection for you. That's right. That's how strongly the connection was. You're either tunneling or there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked William Vincent. Well, I continued, by the way, their, the Pharisaic doctrine of the resurrection was inseparably bound up with their view of the resurrection and restoration to the physical land. It also involved the, the physical restoration of Jerusalem, the temple, the priesthood, and the purified sacrificial system, and including the imposition and the purification of the rite of circumcision. So I asked William Vincent, and we would ask Doug Wilson the same question. Since you are arguing, okay, uh, Pharisees believed in physical resurrection. Paul said he was Pharisee. Therefore, Paul believed in physical resurrection. Well, the Pharisaic doctrine of the resurrection demanded physical restoration to the physical land, physical uh, restoration, purification of the city of Jerusalem, the temple, the priesthood, animal sacrifices, and circumcision. They saw that as one single united doctrine, absolutely inseparable. So when I asked William Vincent if he also believed <laughs> that Paul taught, oh, restoration to, to the land, well, Paul said, do not set your affection on the things in the land. Colossians chapter 3. Paul completely repudiated the concept and the belief of the Pharisees, oh, restoration to the land. No, Paul repudiated that. Okay. So if you, if you are going to reject that Pharisaic doctrine of the imposition of circumcision in a purified manner, not spiritual, physical circumcision, the priesthood, the animal sacrifices, the temple, the city, and the physical land, upon what basis are you going to argue for the Pharisaic doctrine of the resurrection? Got to be consistent, which the dispensationalists, at least, are much more consistent than Mr. Doug Wilson would be. Absolutely. And this raises this further question. If Paul, and by the way, I developed this question extensively in my book, Paul on Trial, if Paul actually believed the identical thing that the Pharisees did on resurrection. Now, remember, Paul said, you're a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee. For the hope of the resurrection, I'm on trial. I believe all things concerning the resurrection found in Moses along the prophets, which they themselves agree. Okay. So when Paul's standing before the Sanhedrin and he says, brethren, I'm a Pharisee. All of a sudden, the Sadducee is saying, hang him <laughs> off with his head. Pharisees thought, going, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, this is a pretty good old boy after all. Uh, we find no fault with this man. Okay. Fourteen days later, according to the narrative of Acts 23 into chapter 24, verse 15. Fourteen days later, the Pharisees go from saying, we find no fault with this man, to where Paul is saying, this I confess to you, that after the way which they call a sect, so worship by the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law, the prophets, 
that there is about to be the resurrection of the just and the unjust, which is Daniel chapter 12, by the way, Mr. Doug Wilson. Why then did the Pharisees want to kill Paul? 14 days after saying, this dude is a, he's one of us. He said he's one of us. He believes in the resurrection. 14 days later, those same identical people want to kill him. Why? For his views of the resurrection. What changed? I suggest that what changed was they came to understand the nature of the resurrection as Paul was teaching it, that it wasn't their concept, biological bodies coming out of the graves. It wasn't the restoration to the land. Again, Colossians chapter 3 proves that beyond a shadow of a doubt. It wasn't about the city, the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the new moons and the feast days. No, no. Now, for Paul, all, everything about the resurrection taught in the Old Testament was absolutely true. But Paul did not believe in the restoration of any of those physical realities that the Pharisees inextricably tied up with resurrection. I, I, I Look, when early on, I believed that this argument that Doug Wilson's trying to make here, I honestly did think that was somewhat of a strong argument until you actually start examining Paul on trial. I, I think um, that and that they learned that his doctrine of the resurrection wasn't grounded in the land, but it was grounded in Christ. Bingo. And I think that that is where they started seeing the disconnect. And it was like, well, even if he believes in a spiritual resurrection, so what? There's there's other people that believe that too. I mean, that's even that's that's one up better than the Sadducees. <laughs> but when they saw, oh, but it's it's founded in Christ, and and in Christ is taking is replacing being in the land and the temple and the priesthood and all this other stuff. I think that's when they were like, no, it can't be in Christ. It can't be this. And I think that's exactly what was happening in Acts chapter four, when Peter and John were preaching Jesus Christ. And part of the part of the controversy was they were preaching resurrection in Christ. Hello, uh, yeah, the Pharisees would have said, "Preach, preach the resurrection, there, Peter and John. Uh, we're here in the land; it's going to happen right here." And they're going. Peter and John said, "No, no, no. Uh, eternal life is in Christ. Eternal life is resurrection." Let's face it. So. I think you're exactly right on that point. And uh, speaking of that, we're out of time. Uh, we promised, folks, we promised to restrict ourselves to one hour this evening. We're going to do that. And my clock is just getting ready to turn over to seven. Uh, as usual, Mike, had a great time, great discussion. And we will plan on doing this, ladies and gentlemen, again next week. So we'll see you there. All right. Nice to meet you, Don. All right. Very good. I'll get this process just as soon as I can and get it posted. Awesome. All right, man. Good night. All right. Take care, man.